This episode is brought to you by Modal Electronics, who enable you to play and perform powerful sound with their incredible synthesizers. You can enjoy vibrant wavetable patches with the Argon 8 series, or you can produce with state-of-the-art analog-style synth textures with the Cobalt 8 series. To check out Modal Electronics' incredible array of synthesizers, go to modalelectronics.com. Modal Electronics. Dare to sound different. Well, I mean, I've tried to think about, like, the dividing line between you know, being like a 10 year old and there were just songs that I liked um, and just, I liked music like anybody else likes music to the, the time when um, it really became like a kind of medication for me. Like it was a a way of just changing how I felt. And I, I think, I think it might've been Led Zeppelin. I think Led Zeppelin was a big part of it. Maybe ACDC, like around the sixth or seventh grade, like age, you know, 11 or 12. But, you know, before that, I just listened to the radio like other kids listen to the radio. And then after that, whatever it was, I I needed it, needed it to feel whole. Well, I mean, you know, you and me both, you and me both. (laughs) Uh, And when did you start becoming kind of creative, um, and, and, and when, when did you kind of like start thinking that you wanted to kind of devote your life to, to, to doing creative things, particularly musical things? Well, I mean, I, I'd always been like a creative kid, you know, like you sort of standard drawing and writing weird little science fiction stories and stuff. Um, this, is an, this is another thing that I, I have tried to like find the memory of the moment where I was like, I just have to do this with my life um because i I, you know i I grew up i grew up on army bases my dad was in the army and there there just wasn't like that experience of like somebody's older brother played guitar and showed me a couple of chords like i was completely in a vacuum as far as i could tell and uh so like wanting to play music was this kind of desperate desperate um impossible hope why why did it seem so impossible well, because I, I I didn't know where to start, you know, like it like it was on an army base, so I, like I didn't know anybody who played guitar. I didn't know anybody that had the guitar. Um, eventually, something happened that was like, you know, like my freshman year in high school. You know, somebody was like, "Let's start a band. You be the bass player," and I was like, "Okay, I guess I'm the bass player." And uh, I borrowed a bass from a, a kid on the football team um and uh didn't um i i was never uh very um competent at at figuring out other people's songs or never really had the patience to like you know sort of you know tinker around trying to figure out uh riffs um i just immediately started like just banging on the low e string and yelling and kind of writing my own songs so it it you know i i started out as a songwriter that's really interesting. So you thought, you said you didn't have the patience for it. I mean, how did you kind of learn? I mean, Through every writing. time, yeah, I mean, every time I learned something new, I would write a song around it or a song, you know, uh, whatever kind of weird exploration you could call a song. But like, um, eventually I switched to guitar and, um, and, uh, you know, I would like learn, you know, like whatever, like a like a C chord and that, you know, so I'd write a song using the C chord and, you know, any anything I learned, I just I just turned into a song. And, you know, the, it was like the riffs people were learning were like, uh, you know, a lot of Clash, U2, The Police, like those those kind of bands um were the ones that the kids who could play instruments were um learning riffs by and I, there was just something about me like it was like doing homework it, it just uh you know like i just got like flustered and frustrated and no you know, it, it was much- a big turnoff it's a huge yeah. like, it feels like a real drag uh 
to have a task of like, oh, I'm going to do this like guitar course or something. I'm going to do this piano course and do all yeah. the steps. And, you know, maybe like a few months later, I'll be good. That sounds crap. But like writing a song based on something that you pick up quickly sounds a lot more appealing, right? Yeah, just like making a super loud noise and yelling. And yeah, and the other the other thing was like people would show me a riff and I would immediately start playing it at whatever the speed it was on on the record and people would be like well you have to start slow and that didn't make sense to me so i was like it's not it you know like message in a bottle like do do da do do da do do da do that's not message in the bottle is do do da do da da do da da do da 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 so, so it's like all of the things that uh, music teachers would kind of say, like, don't do, you did. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, and um, I gained a, a style that was pretty unique um, that I've kept throughout my life and also gained some bad habits that, that, you know, make some kinds of playing more difficult for me, but... Um, you know, I mean, my, my, uh, my core as an artist is in those early flaws as a guy trying to learn an instrument. So I'm ultimately pretty grateful for it. That's a, yeah, I, that's a really positive way of, uh, of looking at it and the right way to look at it, because you've obviously made some great music regardless oh, of, of you. you know, whether, uh, like a, a Ponzi conservatoire would say that that's the right way to learn. And like, I mean... And also you've been like wildly like creative in a number of different ways. I mean, this this wouldn't be the logical uh, next question necessarily, but I wanted to talk about your your books. Like mm. what an awesome uh, thing to do to write two books. Um, what what led you to to write? The first one was Book of Drugs, right? The Book of Drugs. Yeah, first one was Book of Drugs. Basically, I knew an editor um, and I was I'd always been a writer and I had written some some like record reviews for a for a, a weekly paper in New York in the early 90s and you know a couple other things here and there um and I just knew an editor that was willing to well first I talked to a, a book agent who was like well we you gotta write an outline and then you gotta you, you know this all this stuff and I was like I just don't want to do that like if I'm gonna write a book I just want to sit down and start writing and an editor found me, an editor at Hachette, who um, was willing to just give me enough money that I could spend time on it and was going to leave me alone. And uh, was so hands off that um, the, the Book of Drugs has no chapter uh, breaks in it. It's just like, you know, like there'll be like a three paragraphs and then a little space and then another page and then space and then a paragraph. So I didn't I didn't split it up. And I, I sent it in uh, thinking I'd get feedback on how to split it up. And the editor was like, man, this is really great the way you didn't split it up. Like, that's really interesting. Yeah. I was like, sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Absolutely. hundred percent meant it to be that way. Of course. <laughs> and, and, and why are you, why were you put off the idea of writing things out in advance and, and doing an outline? Cause it seems to kind of link somewhat to the way that you wanted to, learn music and in doing both of both of those things might I add uh, I feel like I definitely share a kinship there I would not want to write mm. spend ages on an outline and uh, I've never enjoyed like formal music education I mean I think uh I think it, I was opening opening myself up to getting feedback um too early in the process so it's my dog um you know, like I, it's one thing to get feedback on something that's like semi-complete, but if you're just giving someone like a list of, you know, basic sketches and, you know, cause I mean, that that's just the thing and, you know, making books or making records or, you know, making whatever is there's people that want to give feedback often just because they want to give feedback. And it just seemed like an invitation for somebody to like kind of poke their nose into stuff that that uh, I didn't need them poking their nose into, basically. Yeah. Do, does does getting feedback on music and 
and other creative projects do you find that's something that's easy or or difficult um i mean it depends on who i'm looking to get the feedback from if it's uh you know if i go to like one person at a time and play them the record and get their feedback um that's different from sending something to like 20 people and then getting all these notes back from people um that can be overwhelming and also like people ha have like a, a million justification for things they don't like um and it, it never really helps you know if somebody's like i really like this fast song you know that that is something you can actually do something with but if somebody's like Oh, I, you know, I don't know. I don't like saxophones. You know, what am I going to do with that? Like, you know, it, it's <laughs> if I learn that, then don't listen yeah, to a record with a with a saxophone. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I actually have a, a, a friend um, uh, who is like a Grammy winning, like famous guy. And I play him my stuff for feedback sometimes. And almost always like I sit down knowing like I'm not going to take any of this guy's advice. Like any, and he's, you know, um, and it's all, it's always interesting to listen to him because it's a different perspective, but, you know, he wants to like smooth out rough edges and, you know, he, he's just got a different agenda um, than I do. Yeah. Yeah. Well, everybody's got their own perspective on things and sure. I mean, being authentic is really the name of the game if you want to do anything that's quality but I, i'm yeah i'm just floored by the amount of creativity uh you know the the amount that you engage in creativity so oh, okay. in, in terms of uh the link between because obviously you know your first book talks about your struggles with addiction um mm. is there a link between your kind of your need for music and your need to be creative and that sort of I don't know, you know, the proclivity to get addicted to, to drugs or to other things. Well, I mean, I, I do know that, that what I loved about music is that it really changed my feelings. Um, it had a very uh, drug-like effect, you know, um, and uh, it still has a drug-like effect. Um, it's, you know, eventually, eventually heroin stopped working, but like, Black Sabbath has never let me down. Works just <laughs> as good as the first time. <laughs> yeah, that's that's uh, very true. And uh, have you read uh, Ozzy Osbourne's autobiography? No, I have not. I, I would recommend that. It's a very funny book. Uh, awesome. So, so you've got a new band called Ghost of Room. Ghost um, of Room. Why did you decide to form it? What, what's the what's the story uh, behind behind the band? Well, so me and uh, Andrew Scrap Livingston, who is a cello player who play, essentially plays bass on the cello, which gives it kind of a, uh, a, a unique tone. It's like, it sort of sort of sounds like the bass on, on Fania salsa records in the 70s. You know, there's a certain kind of sound that those basses had, but that's, I'm getting to abstract. Um, he and I had been playing together for like 15 years or something. And, you know, initially I had hired him and he was like a, like a hired side man. And then eventually we just kind of became a band. We came like, we became like an aesthetic unit as opposed to, you know, an artist and his backup dude. Um, and and um, in terms of the sound of the band, it really developed from um, listening to a lot more sort of groove based music working with a lot of break beats, um, you know, like the old, uh, you know, break beats you used to find on hip hop records, um, the classic breaks, um, sort of working with samples again, started doing the sort of chanting thing that I did in soul coughing, the kind of like not really rapping, not really singing, whatever thing that I did. Um, and that was the sound. Um, and that's how Ghost of Room came to be. And so you put out Ghost of Room One, uh, and that that was this year. So, are you hoping to gig now that things are, are easing up? Well, we're actually uh, going to make. Um, so the first album we put out, well, the first 
EP we put out was Ghost of Room 2 because we did it bef- <laughs> after we did Ghost of Room 1. Um, we were we had finished up, uh, literally I was in the studio with Mario Caldado sequencing the album when the pandemic happened. We were in California. I drove all the way back to Memphis. Um, and then over the summer, so we held the release until we could play shows again, um, which we thought was going to be sooner than it, w- it was. Um, and then over the summer, we wrote a new EP. And so when we put it out, we thought it'd be hilarious to call it Ghost of Room 2. Um, so <laughs> Ghost of Room 2 came out in August. Ghost of Room 1 came out like six weeks ago. And I'm headed out to California with Scrap to make Ghost of Room 3. And then I guess, I mean, I guess we're not going to really play shows till 2022. We do a lot of like uh, improvisation gigs where we, we, you know, we play a bar and, and you know, just uh, just improvise all night, you know, with a drummer and, you know, sax player or another guitar player or something. Um, and so we'll probably do some of those, but like real touring is unlikely to be until next year. That's interesting. Is, is that is that just going to be the case um, throughout? Like, do you reckon shows will be back in the US? Or do you reckon it's, it's going to be, uh, but like everything will be, still be shut down, like music wise? I think people are going to start touring um, in September. I think that's when, sh- like festivals are going to start happening. And uh, um, the problem with it is, everybody's going to want to be on the road. Yeah. Um, and it's actually, it's actually not easy to get gigs. Like I've asked my agent to like look into getting, uh, you know, gigs in November or, you know, something like that. And like, it's all booked. Like they, like everybody's, everybody like kind of put their dibs on the shows um, before they knew that whether or not the shows were going to happen. And now it looks like they're going to happen, but so we're going to have to wait. Shit, that's very annoying. Uh, and it would it would also be pretty cool though. I think cooler than a show to see you guys improvise in a bar. Well, how often do yeah. you do that? Well, yeah, I mean, we did it like once a month on average for I don't know, like a year before um, before we did uh, Ghost of Room One. Um, Scrap still lives in New York, so he would have to fly down for it. And I did a bunch with, you know, a bunch of different Memphis-based musicians. So I was doing like two, three a month the past few years. That's really cool. Yeah, um, it's what, super what, fun, yeah. And what, how, how, do you, how do you select the bar? Is it bars that you like hanging out in, or do you just choose one? It's a bar, I mean... It, it's a DKDC, which is like two blocks from me. And, you know, I know all the bartenders and all the wait staff and the owner and the guy who books it and, you know, the lady who manages it. And, you know, it's just, uh, it's keeping it simple. That's really cool. Yeah. It's very cool. Yeah. That's that's awesome. Uh, I wanted to talk a bit about your relationship with music as a fan. How do you tend to consume your music? Well, I'm a song guy more than an album guy. Um, I usually find somewhere between like 10 and 20 songs a year that I really love. Um, I have really been getting into, um, the discovery playlists on Spotify, um, you know, which is still like, I'm very picky and I'll like one thing out of the 30 things they, you know, recommend to me every week, but, you know, all you need is one amazing song to play over and over again. And, uh, you know, that's, that's the drug, man. That's, <laughs> that's how it works for me. So you don't like listening to full records. If sometimes there's, a, there's an artist that I find that I love so much, like, like when I, like, uh, Bon Iver, uh, Phoebe Bridgers. Um, there's a, there's a bunch of artists that, when I found them, I really listened to the record in full a bunch of times. And then it got winnowed down and winnowed down and winnowed down and winnowed down to be, um, you know, just a song or two. I really am like sort of a singles based personality. And then when, when you find that tune that you, you like, you just like listening to it again and again and again. 
over and over again. Yeah, absolutely. Do you then get tired of the songs and think, God, I really don't like that one anymore? No. <laughs> like I don't, no, like like once once I love something, I kind of love it forever. It's hard to uh um you know, maybe I, there's like some kind of experiment I could run where I could listen to something for 48 hours straight and see how I felt about it a, a week later, but uh that would be a very know. interesting experiment. I mean, it would be similar to the way that my mate's dad put his son off smoking, uh, his young son off smoking, where right. he caught his son having a cigarette and then gave him a whole pack of 20 and said, right, you've got to smoke this whole pack now. And right. it was his first cigarette. You know, he had to yeah. sit there, smoke all 20, and by the end of oh, it, man. he didn't have it anymore. So I imagine with the song, it would be a little bit like that. Maybe, you know. Yeah. I wouldn't want to do it. I want, I want to keep my love for the song. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And so you've sent over five songs. Uh, how would you characterize these songs? Are these sort of like a snapshot of the type of tune that you would get addicted to? Yeah, I mean, um, like when you talk about my favorite songs, I have like 500 favorite yeah. songs. Um, so this is just things that I've been uh, listening to lately that I really love, that I've loved for a long time. And one song that's like, two or three years old that is um a recent discovery but i listen to over and over again uh, so so what is it about i can fucking tell by st john that you like mm. um it's so cold um and it's such a it really kind of lives in hip-hop and r&b despite that for for the majority of the song it's an acoustic guitar and a voice. Um, and then of course it expands and you know, more elements come in. Um, but it's so lonely and desperate and the lyrics are so great. Um, uh, uh, she stood there with her left, left hand on her gun and her right hand on her heart. It's a killer line. Um, I love the voice, I love the persona of the singer um yeah that's just love everything about it and do you, do you listen to more st john or just that tune yeah there's a song there's a song called monica Lewinsky that i like a lot <laughs> which is like you know boogie with a hoodie is on it there's an amazing verse on it um yeah i mean there's other so he put out a new album i think last year and uh i listened to some of the songs from it but again, like I like I'm like a, you know, if I if there's an artist that I like five songs by, they're like giants to me. That's that's interesting. I mean, I guess it's very similar with a lot of people, but I feel like a lot of people discuss full albums, uh, having only listened to them once and stuff. Uh, I, I I get a bit. Uh, I feel like I need to listen to an album quite a few times before I've got a real in-depth knowledge of it. So that's why the kind of song-based approach, given the amount of content that we're being bombarded with all the time, sure. is probably one of the only ways of effectively wading through it. Uh, Sex Machine, of course, is definitely a song that I've heard about a thousand times. Uh, but oh, why, yeah. why, why did you pick it in this current uh, moment? Um, the way he uses language, um, the way that uh, he uses repetition, um, mm. I, I love the going to the when it, when he's like let's you know let's take it to the bridge because he because you know the bridge is like supposed to be eight bars in the middle of the song and it's after the second chorus and before the last chorus but it's just he goes to the bridge and just lives there forever <laughs> he's just like let's move everything to the bridge the only chord change in the song um Every like this, there's so much repetition in the song that the tiniest change becomes absolutely huge. Like, you know, there's the, the repetition with Bobby Bird, you know, get up, get on up, get up, get on up. And that he it reverses it once. And I don't know if it's a fuck up, but but it's it sort of goes, get on up, get up, uh, just it happens once in the song, and it is a massive gesture you know it's this tiny little change but in the context of something that repetitive it's this giant move i also i love the, the story 
um, which may or may not be true, but I love the story that at, at some point in the late 60s, James Brown's band came to him and said, James, we don't think this is music. You know, not not like we don't think this is good music or we don't think this is commercial music. We literally do not think this is music, you know, <laughs> which is like incredible. Like that's like if you, yeah, the, what an achievement. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I wonder what they'd think about some some of the music uh, today if if they didn't make like this music. But uh, I mean, he uh, he like invented the the universe. He did. Yeah. And, uh, Have you seen the documentary about him? Or well, I think it's HBO, but I saw it on Netflix. Oh, I've seen a couple of documentaries about him. I haven't once seen one in the past few years, so. I think it, it was from a few years ago, but I hadn't seen it. If you've seen a couple, then you you may have seen this one. But uh, he seemed like quite a complicated guy, James Brown, for sure. Super, super complicated. Um, you know the thing about how he fined his band when they yeah. would fuck up? And we'd just do like, a like that. And we'd just go like this. I saw some... Maybe, maybe it's the one you're talking about, um, but one of his tour managers watched some old footage and there's like a, a moment where, where Jamie goes, Ew! and it's like, he goes, oh yeah, he just finds somebody 50 bucks. Like, yeah. Ew! That, that meant like, you know, guitar player, you fucked up a chord. That's going to cost you $50 off your paycheck. Yeah, there's something about that, even though it's, you know, not, not very nice. Uh, there's something about that that, I don't know, I think... I admire the way he wanted it all to be so good and also how hard he worked by the sounds of things. He was doing like 300 shows a year or something till he Yeah. Did. Well, I, I admire just the subtlety of the gesture. Just be like, yeah, you know, like that's it. That's all it takes. <laughs> um, I, of course, would not want to be on the receiving end of no, no, no. Of you'd losing hate, 50 bucks. You'd hate yeah. him. You'd, you'd, yeah. be, you'd think he was the biggest arsehole ever. And by the sounds of things... Um, uh, from what I saw about the band being interviewed, they were still super respectful and they didn't uh, give him any kind of posthumous bashing for that type of behavior. They just kind of said right. how it was, but they s still seemed to have some respect for him, which is- uh, Oh my God, yeah. Ooh, yeah, yeah, I mean, how, I mean, such a job. I don't think he was fun to work with. No. But, you know, to be, just to be in the presence of somebody that thought that differently from everything else that was going on in the world must have been insane yeah that's the thing about pop culture now though is that there's still so much excellent stuff more excellent stuff than ever but it yeah it, it doesn't feel like there's anything as revolutionary as that it feels like oh, so much stuff every boundary is being crossed whereas people like james brown in the context of uh, of the world that they inhabited to just like release a song called Sex Machine and dance like that and behave like yeah. that in the 60s. Like, I don't think I can't even get my head around like how that would have fit into that world. That would have literally just been like, whoa, what the, what, you know, what yeah. the fuck is going on uh, with that? Whereas now it's like, where do you go? Like, yeah, I don't know. But I don't know, man. Like, I, There's all sorts of stuff. I don't know what amazing. it would be like to hear something that was that incredible of a piece of art that was that different from from everything. Something that would make you question, is this music? Like, <laughs> is this music at all? I, I just love that. Yeah, yeah. That's, I, I hadn't heard that story. I, I'd heard the one about the bandmates, but the, yeah, that's amazing. Uh, yeah. Different, but equally brilliant. Uh, a Tribe Called Quest, vibes and stuff. Uh, why that song? Um, there's something... I don't want to say creepy, but there's something foreboding about that song. Um, you know, the part where he goes, this is for the slain rappers and the fallen rappers. Um, you know, it's just got that kind of dreamy cadence... And that like that one big note that's like bam at the top of the bar. It's uh you know like a, a xylophone or something, um, and that that like chugging repetitive. I mean repetitive is a word you're gonna hear a lot from me. <laughs> I love repetition. Um, I just I have awesome memories of walking around with like a literally a, a Walkman, literally cassette Walkman, walking around New York listening to that one song over and over again. I mean, that's that album. Low end theory. That is an album. 
I mean, in in my life, there aren't that many albums that I really think like, oh my God, this is an album. Like everything on it relates to everything else. You know, everything on it is necessary. Low End Theory is absolutely an album for me. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I, undoubtedly, do you think that the uh, 90s in some ways were the high point of, of hip hop or do you listen to a lot of hip hop today that's, that you find I you're equally knocked out by? I listen to a, to a fair amount of hip hop today. Um, there is a lot. There is a lot of stuff that I really like. Um, Wi-Fi's funeral. I like Saint John, Boogie with a Hoodie. Um, I have a weakness for Flo Millie, weakness for Cardi B and Nicki Minaj. Um, yeah, there's all kinds of current stuff that I listen to. It seems almost like a different genre. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Than, than, it's it's completely. Know, it's completely actually futile and it's also sort of pointless comparing uh yeah old and new uh I, I don't know why i keep on being drawn to doing that in interviews but uh it is a different it is actually a completely different genre tribe yeah West, isn't it uh, um that sort of jazz sample based breakbeat based um music that was really you, and you just, uh, the, the nature of rapping is just a completely different thing now than it was. I mean, it's it's more about like finding phrases and, and sort of milking all the all the stuff you can get out of like these very particular terse phrases. Now, um, this is America, uh, Childish Gamb Gambino, like perfect example of that. And um, I remember I had a real work of art that video yeah yeah and uh it's funny because most people my age like real hip-hop fans are like oh my god videos an insane work of art but the song is like eh, i'm like dude i love the song i love that kind of stuff but you know mm. you're right it doesn't it, it like it, it descends from hip-hop as it was in the late 80s early 90s but it really is a whole other ball game. Yeah, the song. I mean, the thing is, I got shown the video before listening to the song sure. by itself, and so th that's always going to stay with you once you've seen the video because the two complement each other. But the song is like, given the fact that there's quite, that I find there's less and less that can surprise you. It is like, I don't know. I, I don't know why I find it has a similar effect to like when you put on like Rage Against the Machine very loudly, but it's just like mm -hmm. a kind of it does it, it it's got a powerful effect that song and the yeah. repetition of the phrase and the sort of yeah the, just the, the the power of that record is, is there's like an there's like an ugliness to it yeah you know, but like a, a really a, kind of a, a menace ugly, yeah really cathartic to listen to but did you hear Childish Gambino's album that he released I think it was last year where where all the songs were like just dates or something I listened to that. No. Uh, it's got like no. a white. It's got a white cover, and it's. I think it's like fifteenth of March, twenty twenty, like fifteen three twenty, or and 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 uh, and all the songs are just numbers, um, and it's really really good. The only wow. problem, the only problem is I can't remember its title. I can't remember the <laughs> names of any of the songs because they're just dates that mean nothing to me. But the the music was was amazing, and uh, you know it's quite possible that that it's all easier to remember than I've made it, but yeah. I, I, Do you, have you ever heard of a band called the Numbers Band? No. They were like, they were a, a, like a band from Cleveland in the 70s, and uh, they have a great album out called Jimmy Bell Still in Town that's a reissue of a live thing that they did. So fantastic. It's like, it's like this very trancey, like, you know, invention of house music in 1974, kind of oh. stuff it's so it's the numbers great. band the numbers band but the name of the band is like 15 80 72 like it's it's a sequence of two digit numbers separated by a period and nobody can remember the name of, of the band so they just change it to the numbers band i'm gonna say say that right so did that get uh reissued this yeah it's up it's year. up on the services yeah jimmy bell still in town that's cool i'm gonna save that uh, why Boogie uh, Boogie Dan Productions? My philosophy. 
Oh, just one of the, it, 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 I would say it is the greatest rap song of all time. Like literally that is my choice for greatest rap song of all time. Um, no chorus, just verses. Every line is golden. So hilarious. So incisive. Um, just love Karis. One is a personality. Um, and then just amazing memories of, you know, hearing it for the first time and people listening to that song over and over again, like the dorm. Um, what a fantastic record. And is, is the whole uh, album, by all means necessary, is that, is that really good? Yeah, it's uh, it's good. It's not. It's but you haven't got me, obsessed with like it, my like philosophy. Song. Yeah, I'm, yeah. Like I, I like. Yeah, it, I it, forgot momentarily about the song thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it it came on in a in a in a gym I was at once, at, like as I was heading out the door, and I had to sit down and listen to the whole song. It's like I I can't like you know, uh, hijack my day and listen to the all to all of my philosophy before I'm able to to go about my business. And and uh, in terms of Tom Waits, why did you choose that song? Uh, because I mean, Tom Waits, like, I mean, are you into any of his albums in full? Yeah, well, I love. I still listen to Rain Dogs in full from time to time. Um, yeah, I mean, I think all whenever he puts an out out an album, I listen to the whole album, um, even if I eventually pare it down to a song or two. Yeah, that's a guy that I'll always listen to the to the full artistic statement before I make my little selections. In fact, Gun Street Girl is in the sequence of Rain Dogs. Um, it's like uh, it, there's an instrumental called Midtown, like this sort of spooky spoken poem noise piece called Ninth and Hennepin, and then Gun Street Girl, and it, it just gives me chills thinking about the way those um, those three songs work one after the other. Um, and I was, th I was thinking about that song. Um, I just love how, how much space there is in it. I love the way the banjo sounds so stark. Um, and anybody that hasn't heard the song that hears the word banjo, don't get turned off, listen to it anyway. It's <laughs> better than, it's better than what you're thinking. Um, and it's so imagistic and there, there's so clearly a story, but I was thinking about this. You never, I never really understand what the story is. It's like he escapes from jail. There's some sort of caper. He gets sent back to jail, you know, and there's like all these illusions and moments, um, and, you know, little sequences, um, you know, with her fireman's raincoat and her long yellow hair, they tied her to the tree with a skinny millionaire. Um, John, John, he's long gone, gone to Indiana. He never coming home. Just like these little moments that, you know, you never get the full narrative. You get these pieces. It's so gorgeous. Yeah, he's an incredible songwriter. Yeah. An incredible lyricist. Uh, and well, actually, and melodies. I, I, yeah. I, I saw, um, I mean, you might have a big Lebowski opinion of the Eagles, but uh, <laughs> but but I did I do like that song "Old 55" that Tom Waits. Oh yeah, uh, right. And uh, I do like the Eagles version of that. And I was uh, I was I, I wasn't surprised uh, in a way when I discovered that it was a cover because I was like thinking that the lyrics were much better than than uh, a lot of the Eagles songs. Um, so well, it's funny because he has this he has this whole career as this like balladeer guy um in the 70s and then there was just like this moment in the 80s where he had some kind of like cognitive explosion and just became like the noise guy and the weird instruments guy yeah um it's so fascinating yeah now there, and there doesn't doesn't seem to be like nuts. an evolution it just seems like all of a sudden he just went suddenly it's heart attack and vine yeah yeah that's true although yeah I mean, there's probably, is there any thread running through his work? Well, I think about, I think about um, Step Right Up, No Must, No Fuss, No Spills, You Started a Kiss from Drudgery, everything was with that, like, he was like, like rapping to, you know, whatever, kind of scat rapping to, a ba I think that predates um, Heart Attack and Vine. But um, yeah, I mean, th I think there, there were hints of it. 
but it you know like people that that went to see him in the 80s um expecting the balladeer were very surprised to find like the you know like the freak king that tom waits became i think <laughs> and they were probably quite disappointed because the sort of people that go and hear uh want to hear a nice peaceful ballad uh probably do not did not want to be greated with the sound of uh his quite abrasive voice now yeah uh, yeah it well, is pretty uh, crazy you got to admire somebody right. that does something like that man yeah yeah, hundred yeah. percent. I'm sure. Well, he's definitely not managed to turn off that many people because uh, oh, yeah. everybody's still listening to him and and, and admiring him. Um, I, I've I've really enjoyed talking to you, Mike, uh, and uh, I really appreciate your time. I, I wanted to to finish off by asking you because your your book after the book of drugs, I die each time I hear the sound. Um, what? How does that differ to the to book of drugs? Um. Well, I mean, there was definitely like a narrative arc to the book of drugs. You know, there was, you know, sort of there's the addiction narrative and then there's the narrative of the band, soul coughing. Um, Die Each Time I Hear the Sound is really these two sort of individual pieces, um, you know, and they're, they're put together in kind of a slaughterhouse five kind of a way, like moving through time. Um, there's a lot of stuff about, you know, what New York used to be like, um, you know, the stories are, you know, very like elliptical and small, um, you know, very, very like tight. Um, I like it a lot. I like it better than, than a book of drugs, the book of drugs, to be honest, as a, as a work. Um, how long yeah. does it take you to write a book? Like, how long did it take you to write these two books? Oh, I mean, it, so basically uh, you, you get the deal from the editor and then you wait a year and a half for them to call up and start yelling at you. Uh, <laughs> then when they call up and start yelling at you, you spend a couple months working on it and then you laze and then you spend another month working on it. Die time I hear the sound, I actually, they, I actually had turned in the final draft and the pre-order was up on Amazon and I actually like decided I wasn't happy with it. And I made them like almost literally stop the presses so I could do another draft of it. And I'm so glad I did. I felt like, you know, I cut out like two out of every three adjectives and, you know, tightened it up in a way that I, I, I ended up being really pleased with. Wow. That's a courageous thing to do in, in that kind of moment. Uh, did, was that difficult to kind of get approval to do or whatever? Well, they were mad. Um, but, you know, my editor is a guy I've known for a long time and he's not, you know. Um, also, I, I came to find out that being a book editor means you have a million authors that are always late and are always fucking stuff up. So, um, you know, he... he he was way more used to it than I than I feared. If you're enjoying the Greatest Music of All Time podcast, you can keep up to date with all of our latest episodes for free by subscribing. If you're watching on YouTube, the subscribe button is located at the top of the Tom Cridlin YouTube page. It's also at the bottom right of any video that you watch on YouTube. If you're listening on an audio platform, such as Spotify or Apple Podcasts, you can subscribe at the top of the page.